It's now my pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker. And uh, you will notice from the program that he is, does not come from the field of cultural heritage. And that is entirely by design. It's said that climate change is one of the fastest growing threats to communities and thus to their cultural heritage worldwide. And for those of us in the room that have responsibilities for curating and caring for cultural heritage, conservators, architects, curators, site managers, when we are confronted with a risk, we make sure we have expertise on that risk. If we have a problem with fire, for example, we make sure we have access to expertise on fire suppression, fire response, uh, uh, fire prevention. So it has been said that the warming our globe is experiencing is like our planet being on fire, which means those of us who care about cultural heritage have to ensure that we have access to information about that risk. Indeed, ECOMOS has said that access to basic climate science is a baseline element of cultural heritage management in the 21st century. Some organizations, some cultural heritage management organizations, now have staff climate scientists. For example, Historic Environment Scotland, the National Heritage Agency for Scotland. But for many of us, our in-house climate scientist, our source of climate science information, has been the organization that our keynote speaker leads, the Union of Concerned Scientists. The Union of Concerned Scientists is one of the leading climate, scientists, climate science organizations in the world, but it's also uh, been one of the first climate science organizations in the world to choose to foreground the cultural dimensions of climate change, to build partnerships with those of us in culture and heritage. And so it's entirely fitting that its president should be our uh, opening keynote speaker. The president of the Union of Concerned Scientists, Ken Kimmel, has more than 30 years experience in government, environmental policy, and advocacy, focusing on areas like clean energy, transportation policies, and indeed also cultural heritage, as I said. Prior to joining UCS, uh, Ken was commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. And so it's my pleasure to give you a recognized leader on climate change in the world, and also a fellow I consider my personal uh, access to climate scientist, uh, Ken Kimmel from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Just going to pour myself a glass of water, and then I'll get started. Well, uh, Andrew, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today. This is an extraordinary gathering, uh, an extraordinary collection of people, um, and an extraordinarily important topic. Um, before I worked at UCS and before I was in state government, I was actually an environmental and land use attorney. And uh, every now and then, I had the honor of working with groups and communities that were trying to preserve. It could be land, it could be buildings, it could be a forest. Um, and the very first case I had coming out of law school was representing this tiny town in Massachusetts called the town of Webster. This was a town, uh, like many, that time had somewhat forgotten. Its textile mills had been closed down. It was on its heels economically. It had no political power and not much understanding of how land use decisions are made. And the town was confronting uh, a, a very mortal threat, which was uh, a developer proposed building a giant landfill just uh, inches over the border in an opposing town in a beautiful uh, piece of land uh, that was treasured by the town, um, atop a lake, uh, which is uh, called Lake Chargagagag, Munchagagag, Chabanag, Ungamag, which roughly translates to you fish on your side of the lake, I fish on my side of the lake, and nobody fishes in the middle. <laughs> so uh, this was a community that was up against a absolute threat to its existence, and it was a fight that lasted for a very, very long time. 
We found uh, Native American remains on the site. We found rare salamander species on the site. We even hired a geologist who demonstrated that a major uh, fault zone ran right underneath the landfill site and would be a conduit for pollutants from the landfill to travel down the fault lines right into the town's water supply. And despite all these obstacles that we tried to throw in the way of this developer realizing his dream of building that landfill, that developer just kept coming back. Um, and I literally had nightmares as a young attorney that the developer was the Terminator. <laughs> and that anything we did to disable the Terminator, uh, he would just overcome. So that case is now uh, long in the rear view mirror for me. If you uh, hang with me for uh, my talk at the end, I'll tell you how it all came out. Um, but the Terminator uh, that was the guy building the landfill, uh, what keeps me up at night now and what gives me nightmares is climate change. Climate change is the ultimate terminator to our cultural and our historic heritage and the places we love. Climate change is that bulldozer that's coming um, to destroy the places we care about. And um, the sooner we recognize and act on that, the better off we'll be. So my goals today are to describe the nature of the global threat, identify and highlight how it does affect, is affecting now and will continue to affect our heritage, our cultural resources. I'm going to talk about the solutions to climate change because I think it does no one any good to catalog all the problems without identifying what can we do about it. And the fourth thing I'd like to get to is to talk a little bit more about a topic uh, that's already on the table, which is how can the scientific community and the heritage community work together? And more specifically, how can the love of place and of history and culture provide the energy that we need to overcome this challenge? So to start with where we are, climate change is clearly uh, a result of our own actions, specifically the burning of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, coal, and the destruction of ecosystems that absorb CO2. We just experienced in January the warmest January on record. 2019 was the hot, second hottest year since records began, and the last decade was the warmest ever. Sea levels are rising all around the world, putting lives and billions of dollars of coastal property at risk. Extreme precipitation events are becoming more and more common and more and more vicious, like this inland flooding at the historic town of Harper's Ferry in West Virginia in 2014. We're seeing that climate change is serving as kind of the ultimate force multiplier. This is Hurricane Michael, the Florida Panhandle's first category five hurricane, which traveled overseas that were three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the historical average. That hurricane caused about $18 billion in damage in Florida alone. And of course, catastrophic wildfires as drier conditions are becoming more control uncontrollable as we've tragically seen in Australia. Now I've said that climate change is the ultimate terminator of our cultural and historic heritage. So why do I say that? Well, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy came as a wake-up call to many in the United States. It devastated parts of the New Jersey and New York coastlines. More than 8 million people lost electricity for, for weeks. But it also wrecked historic resources and infrastructure at Ellis Island and Liberty Island, causing about $100 million in damage to that place. As a result of Hurricane Sandy, we at UCS uh, published a report called Landmarks at risk in 2014. It was designed to draw national attention 
to the huge risks that climate change poses to uh, historic sites in the United States, including Colonial Jamestown, NASA's historic Langley Research Center, Colonial Annapolis, and Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. A few years later, we followed this up with a joint report with UNESCO called World Heritage and Tourism in a Changing Climate, which highlighted the threats to 31 iconic cultural and natural world heritage sites in 29 countries. Sea level rise, coastal flooding, and coastal erosion are probably affecting more places than any other combination of climate impacts. A 2019 study of Mediterranean world heritage sites showed that 42 of 49 sites are already at some risk of coastal inundation. That includes the early Christian monuments of Ravenna, the Roman, rules of, uh, the Roman ruins of Arles in the south of France, and the Greek island of Delos, the mythical, the mythical birthplace of Apollo, where sea level rise is causing damage through the, as water rises through the porous limestone substrate. Coastal flooding and storm surges are also affecting historic cities all around the globe, from Annapolis and Charleston in the US to Hoi An, with its hundreds of 16th and 17th century wooden buildings in Vietnam. Museums, libraries, collections are at risk from flooding, fires, changing in temperature, heat and humidity, all posing major threats. Coastal erosion, worsened by rising seas, is threatening thousands of historic, archaeological, and sacred sites, including the Maui statues of Easter Island. Land subsidence due to changed rainfall pattern is damaging the buildings of extraordinary sites at Angor in Cambodia. Thawing permafrost and warming soil temperatures threaten an incredible 180,000 known archaeological sites in the Arctic. Warming oceans have allowed Shipworms, which destroy underwater wooden shipwrecks to expand their limits from the 40th parallel to the 51st since the 1980s. And of course, wildfires, as we've so tragically seen in California and Australia in recent times, have become lo much larger and more intense, destroying people's lives and sweeping away indigenous cultural resources. In fact, every imaginable type of cultural site is under threat from climate change. Not just buildings, not just archaeology, but also complex cultural landscapes. For example, in the Philippines, the 2,000-year-old cultural landscape formed by the Ifugu Rice Terrace faces multiple risks from climate change. And our intangible heritage is at risk, too, all over the world. Here in the US, tradition requires the confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of Montana to wait until the Mission Mountains are snow covered to tell their winter stories and sing songs. They're concerned about what their future will look like in a, in a, in a world in which we have diminished snowfall. So the risks are incredibly high to our cultural and our historic heritage. But as I said, it's not enough just to throw these problems at your lap. I want to talk now about the solutions. And there are solutions still to be had to address this problem. But to get at the solutions, let's first do a little bit of math to identify the nature of the problem and the urgency of solving it. So uh, we are globally, we've increased temperatures above pre-industrial levels by about one degree centigrade, of course, that's an average. And averages always mask the real problem, which is at the, at the extremes, the temperature increase 
particularly uh, in the North Pole, is much, much higher than that. But globally, we're at about one degree centigrade. We have uh, a goal that was set forth in the Paris Agreement, um, and I'm just going to read it because the, the actual wording is quite important. It's holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees centigrade and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. So that's, that's the science-based goal that we need to get to. Now, staying within uh, this target is going to be quite a challenge. That green line represents global uh, worldwide uh, emissions to date. Um, that baseline is where the scientists predict we will get if we do nothing, if we continue with, bait, with, with business as usual. And you can see that's about a four degree centigrade increase world. That's a world that none of us would ever want to leave behind for our kids and our grandkids. Now the good news is if you look at the bottom of the gray shading, that's about where uh, scientists predict we will get to if all the countries that sign the Paris Agreement meet the pledges that they agreed to um, on time. And you can see that makes a substantial difference. That gets us to under three degrees centigrade. Of course, that's making the her heroic assumption that all these countries do exactly what they say and do it on time, and there's reasons to doubt that. But the, but the point is, the agreement gets us part of the way, for sure, and that's something to be celebrated. But um, look how much farther we have to go to get to two degrees centigrade. And recall, two degrees is not actually the goal. Two degrees is the guardrail. That's the point at which we start really crossing into the danger zone. So we have a very, very long way to go in a very short amount of time. So now, so far I've just talked about temperature. What's the relationship between emissions and temperature? And the scientists and others have also tackled that. And the basic conclusion is, is that in order to have a 50% chance of meeting the ultimate Paris goal, we need to be at net zero worldwide by about mid-century. Net zero means a dramatic decrease in all the burning of fossil fuels for our energy needs, and it means offsetting with nature or technology the emissions that we still have at that point. So we need to get to net zero, um, and to do that, these are current or projected emissions. In order to have that 50% chance, we need to get to net zero by 2060. So look at how, that, how dramatic that, that line is. And for every decade that we delay getting to net zero, we cut the chance of ever meeting that goal uh, by 10%. So that's the fundamental challenge that we face. Now what's the vision that really underlies net zero? The vision is that we use a combination of technology advance and mobilized citizens in conjunction to wean ourselves from fossil fuels and transition towards a clean world economy. It's a vision in which wealthy countries continue to maintain their standard of living and even grow it. It's also a vision that allows poorer countries who are developing to also grow and also enjoy the benefits of an energy economy. But they do that not by repeating the mistakes all of our countries have made in becoming addicted to fossil fuels, but really leapfrogging over them, much the way that developing countries have leapfrogged over landlines for telephones and are now operating cellular. So that, that's the, the vision. And now I want to talk a little bit about how, how do we get there. So in doing that, I want to point out that there are enormous differences between building a bridge and laying down stepping stones. A bridge, think about net zero as a bridge that crosses a large body of water that takes us from where we are now to where we need to be, which is net zero. So that's one approach. 
A second approach is a stepping stone approach where we lay stepping stones down over this body of the water in the hope that if we keep laying them, we'll actually get to where we need to be. So here's an example of a stepping stone approach. We, in the United States and elsewhere, we have shut down uh, a number of coal-burning power plants. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, a lot of that capacity has been replaced by natural gas. That is a stepping stone because natural gas is cleaner than coal. However, we're not actually going to get to net zero by substituting natural gas for coal. And so the problem, in a nutshell, with a stepping stone approach is eventually you don't get all the way over um, through it. So we've got to be thinking about this bridge from where we are now to where we need to get to in, uh, in, in mid-century. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the bridge. What are the pieces of it? How do they need to get built? How do we do this? And there's five pieces to this bridge. And I think what I will be saying here is not just my own opinion, but um, if you look at all of the deep decarbonization studies and literature, you'll see different emphases on different things, but these are the big five pieces of this bridge. So I'm going to go through them. The first one involves using all energy as efficiently as we possibly can. And there's a lot of different ways that all of us in our own life know this and are doing it. It's things like LED light bulbs that have saved enormous amounts of electricity. It's new buildings that are super well insulated and use natural light to get to the point where they're on an annual basis using almost no net energy. It's appliance standards that run our refrigerators and air conditioners and, and boilers much more efficiently. It's cars that get more miles per gallon. It's locating our housing in densely populated areas near transit. So there's all of these different strategies to use less energy. And there's some good news here. Um, this is starting to work. This is a slide that shows uh, the blue line is our energy consumption. The green line is our economic growth in the United States. And you can see that our energy demand peaked in about 2007 yet the economy has continued to grow. And that is a very significant achievement that we've been able to decouple energy use from economic growth. Not only that, um, we've saved an enormous amount of money by being a more energy efficient country. It's said that for every dollar you invest in energy efficiency, you get about $3 back in costs that you avoid. We've put thousands if not millions of people to work, weatherizing homes, replacing old equipment, because this is work that you can't outsource to another country. So it's funny, I would say the hardest challenge about energy efficiency is that it's kind of boring. Um, it's, it's not the shiny new gadget, it's a number of little things that really everyone can do. Um, but I would say one challenge is to make sure that in society, it's recognized as a virtue to use energy efficiently and, wild, and, and wisely. And that's a cultural shift that all of us can help bring about. So that's the first piece of the bridge. Use energy as efficiently as you can. The second is to get carbon out of the electric generating system. So today, uh, about 40% of our power nationally uh, is, is generated by non-carbon sources, a combination of nuclear and hydroelectric and wind and solar. So we need to get to 100% um, in approximately three decades. How do we do that? Uh, it's not a technology problem. We can build uh, solar, we can build wind, we can back them up with energy storage, we can preserve our existing nuclear power plants rather than let them prematurely uh, close due to economic conditions. And there is a, a great deal of good research and development being done on running natural gas plants uh, with equipment that will actually capture and sequester the carbon emissions that come out. So um, we've got essentially the technology that we need to decarbonize the electric sector. 
And the trend lines are good. Um, in the last number of years, uh, we've been building a great deal of wind and solar energy to the point where uh, about two-thirds of our new electric generating capacity is coming um, from wind and solar. Now, this ramp up is admirable, but it's nowhere near the rate that we actually need. So we've got to accelerate that. How do we do it? We can put a price on carbon emissions and take away this crazy subsidy that we're giving to coal and gas plants, which essentially is a free use of the Earth's atmosphere as a sewer for pollution. So we could, we could shut that down um, with a carbon price. We could have a national clean energy standard that requires utilities over time to buy more and more clean energy. We could build out a whole national infrastructure and put millions of people to work building transmission lines to connect wind farms in the Great Plains to our cities, to build out uh, an offshore wind capacity, to build more solar. So all of these things um, can and should be done right away. And I've, as I've said many times, this is not rocket science. The technology is there. It's about political will to accelerate it. So that's the second part of the bridge, decarbonizing the electric sector. And the beauty of doing that is it leads right to the third section of the bridge. Once we, electri once we decarbonize our electric sector, we can run just about everything on electricity, including our cars, our trucks, our buses, our industrial processes, and our heating. Um, so look at this picture. This is a solar panel collecting energy that's then used as a charging station for cars. This is a thing of beauty in a carbon-constrained world. This is the type of twofer solution that we need to be pushing for. And again, the trend lines are favorable. The price of uh, batteries and electric cars is coming down. Many experts think that by about the mid or early 2020s, it'll cost just about the same to buy an electric car as a new gas-fired one. And of course, the minute you buy an electric car, you start saving money because electric, electricity is way cheaper than gas, and they have very much fewer moving parts. They're much simpler, much more beautiful machines. So um, the economics are moving in the right direction. But as is the case with the electric sector, we need to accelerate this. And again, no mystery here on, on what we need to do. It's about getting the incentives in place. It's about helping people uh, who of moderate and low incomes to be able to afford an electric car, whether new or used. It's about building charging stations so the people who don't have driveways and garages can conveniently charge their cars. Again, nothing terribly difficult about it. It's a matter of political will to accelerate that change. So that's the third piece uh, of the puzzle, is electrifying the end uses. The fourth is we need to recognize that no matter how good a job we do in lowering our emissions, we're still going to have to uh, remove some of the emissions from the atmosphere, because in reality, we're probably not going to get to zero emissions. So, uh, I think as anyone who uh, remembers grade school education knows, trees do an amazing job of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In fact, it's estimated that right now trees offset about 10% of the uh, emissions in the United States. We are reforesting at the rate of about a million acres per year. If we could double or triple that, um, it's estimated that we could uh, offset about 40% of our emissions. So trees are a huge part of the solution, as are preserving and enhancing wetlands and using modern agroecology agro techniques in farms to sequester more carbon, which of course will also make those farms uh, more productive and solve another major problem we face. But we also have to recognize, especially globally, that the trend line here is not towards increasing forests. It's actually, uh, unfortunately, the opposite. We're cutting down our uh, world's forests at an enormously dangerous rate. So priority one needs to be to preserve those forests. 
but we're also most likely going to need some help from technology to remove carbon emissions from the atmosphere. And so that's another piece of, of the bridge. To do that, I think we have to do two things. One is we have to think about carbon dioxide very differently. We think of it now as a waste product. We're going to need to think about carbon dioxide as a resource. And two, we need a global man on the moon project to come up with this technology. It needs to be a private and public partnership of all the actors in the world done in an open source way to develop the technology that we need to safely remove carbon from the atmosphere and hopefully reuse it for economically beneficial purposes. So that's the fourth section of the bridge. The fifth is to recognize that carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. We also have other, in fact, somewhat more dangerous pollutants. And I say they're more dangerous because they can trap heat more effectively than carbon. And once again, we do have the technologies we need to address these gases. One of them is methane. Methane comes from a variety of sources, including uh, oil and gas drilling operations. It turns out that there are remote sensors that can detect methane leaks. It turns out that relatively uh, easy to use and inexpensive technology can be deployed by oil and gas operations to contain methane. So again, not, not rocket science. Another dangerous gas is HFCs that are found in air conditioning. This is a huge issue because as the world gets hotter and as countries, uh, particularly in the global south, emerge from poverty, they're going to want air conditioners just like we do. Um, so we need to make sure that those air conditioners are equipped with substitutes for HFCs, which exist. And in fact, uh, it's a mostly American companies that have the technology to do that. So this is a matter of political will to see those things happen. So those are the five sections of the bridge. Of the bridge. And now I want to talk a little bit about what we can all do to get this bridge designed and built. And I'm going to start with uh, a quote from Helen Keller, who once said, science may have found a cure for most evils, but it's found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. So I can see just from this gathering that the historic and cultural community is not apathetic. I'm glad to see that there's a sense of urgency here We've seen that uh, since 2014 in the Pococantico call for action, um, which many of the participants uh, are here today. We see it in various mobilizations. The Society for American Archaeology created a new climate change task force. Three major international conferences called Keeping History Above Water were organized under the auspices of the Newport Restoration Foundation and the National Park Service published a seminal report on managing cultural resources in a changing climate. At UCS, we've been working uh, to support these and other initiatives by helping to bring the best climate science and scientists to share the table with cultural heritage managers and experts. We're working right now with colleagues at James Cook University in Australia to help develop the Climate Vulnerability Index, which is a rapid assessment methodology designed to specifically uh, analyze world heritage sites. We've tested that site, th this, this method, at the Neolithic archaeological sites of the Orkney Islands in Scotland. We've also worked with ECOMOS, the International Council for Monuments and Sites, through its new Climate Change and Heritage Working Group to draft the future of our past report on engaging cultural heritage in climate action. And last October in Edinburgh, Scotland, the Climate Heritage Network was launched. UCS is very proud to be among the founding members of this international 
work. But let's be honest, more than this, much more than this, is needed. And so now I'd like to tell you the rest of the story uh, of the Douglas landfill. This was a fight that lasted, as I think I told you, for about 13 years. It was uh, called the mother of all land use battles in Massachusetts. It was a David versus Goliath fight. And during this fight, this affected community never gave up. And they recognized that democracy was their friend. And so they marched on the State House in Massachusetts. They wrote letters. They, they, they showed up in their legislators' offices. And during the campaign for governor in 1998, they made so much noise about this that the two candidates running against each other both pledged to save the land and then started having competing television ads saying which candidate was more likely to preserve this land. I, I kid you not, there, there was a dueling campaign ads. They made this issue like the biggest issue in Massachusetts. And ultimately, uh, one of them got elected who supported preserving the, uh, the, the land. And there was an opportunity uh, to take the land by eminent domain, and it, was, and it was saved. So what's the take home of this story? The take home for me is, is that when places that people love are threatened, they fight with an energy and a tenacity and a creativity that is really unparalleled in any activism that we see. And so I would say to all of you, we need that same passion, that same creativity, that same tenacity to fight this global threat. And much the way that uh, those folks in Webster demanded that their leaders fight to save that land, we've got to demand that our leaders start building that bridge to net zero. And so I, my call to you over the next two days, think about the places you love. Think about the places you want to preserve. Think about the fact that the, at climate change is the terminator, is the bulldozer of those sites. How do we harness that passion? How do we harness that energy to stop that terminator and to wrestle that bulldozer down to the ground? And I would say to you, we don't have a lot more time to think about this. We're learning the hard way that time is the most precious commodity of all. And that's because we're running out of it. So thank you very much and good luck.